Hello, everybody. Chris Martinson here. And today we're going to be talking about finance and economics as part of Finance U. Remember, anything that you see in this video and all resources available at our websites or affiliated websites are not intended as or construed as financial advice. This is for educational purposes. Remember, if you have a financial decision, please consult a financial professional. We are not attorneys. We're not CPAs. We are not financial managers. As well, we do our best to be accurate and everything we represent is as accurate as we know it to be. Now, let's turn to our program. Before we get to the punchline of why we think there's a financial crisis, can we set the stage? You do such a wonderful job at this. I'm going to ask you to rewind. Can we go back to Bretton Woods? What was it? Why did it break or when did it break? And, and I think we need that context to understand why we're here today. It's like the problems we have, the predicaments we faced, they didn't happen because of a bad decision last week, right? So, so, and if we have to That's rewind right. further than that, let me know, but that feels like a convenient starting point. Well, in the interest of brevity, we'll start in 1944 then. That's when, okay, Bretton, Woods, that's when Bretton Woods was um, agreed, uh, really, by... I mean, even Russia agreed to it, though they were not a, a signatory to it. I mean, they agreed to it, but they didn't, um, you know, join the system. And um, really, it was that system that um, made the dollar the international currency, and the gold standard was available to central banks um, who could swap their dollars for gold um, at, um, at the Fed or, yeah, I mean, it would have been the Fed uh, or as opposed to the US Treasury, I think, at that stage. So um, that was the basis. So, uh, I mean, you started off, I can't remember the numbers, but uh, there's something like, I don't know, 26,000 tons of gold or something held in America. So this, I mean, this is absolutely solid, but of course, over the years with all the exported dollars, um, you know, wars in Vietnam, Korea first, then Vietnam. So, you know, you had um, also um, trade deficits. Uh, Germany was, um, you know, gradually getting, uh, accumulating gold uh, from her trade surpluses with the United States. So, you know, Gradually, this sort of pile of gold got frittered down and down and down, and it got to a crisis, really, with the London gold pool, which was set up in the 60s because the Americans really wanted to have some uh, some extra help, if you like, uh, to try and, you know, keep the lid on, 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 on the gold price. Um, and um, the gold pool failed in the late 60s. Um, and uh, that was principally France saying, you know, what the hell with this? You know, we want we want gold, not dollars, and others. Admittedly, it's it's not wasn't just just de Gaulle who has um, you know it has been blamed with this crime, as it were, against the dollar. Um, and then, of course, it, this led to um, the real crisis, which was in 1971 when um, America's gold reserves fell to less than eight and a half thousand tons. And at that stage, President Nixon decided that um, he had to suspend the Bretton Woods Agreement. It's It remains suspended, not ended, suspended. But for all practical purposes, it's gone anyway, so we can forget that. And then um, from really 1971 uh, through to the early 1980s, uh, we had a, call it a period of settling down, I suppose, in the new fiat currency regime. And it was extremely uncomfortable. Um, nobody really trusted this new regime. And it was against that background that the uh, gold price went from $35 up to a high at one point of $850. Uh, I think that was in early 1980. Um, and in interest rates, in order to try and bring the situation under control, um, the Fed funds rate rose from around about 6% uh, um, in 1970 to a high of about 19% um, under Volcker, um, who just had to you know, just kill the whole thing. Since then, um, some sort of confidence has come back into fiat currencies. And this really explains why we had declining uh, inflation um, uh, on prices anyway, um, really from about 1980, from that interest rate peak, 1980, 81, all the way down to um, the uh, crisis, if you like, the Lehman crisis. And th this is when you and I were really first started, I think, um, you know, mm -hmm. 
uh, talking together. And, you know, we met, I remember we met in Madrid and, you know, this was uh, the beginning of a very happy friendship, I must say. So, so um, uh, it was really in the, in the wake of that, that we were having not so much a currency crisis, but we were having more of a banking crisis. I mean, we had bank failures in this country, we had bank failures in America. We had German banks which needed to be consolidated because the, basically they were bust and they needed to be rescued. So you had all this sort of stuff going on. Cyprus went bust like the whole country and <laughs> was hung out to dry. Um, so, you know, at that stage, what happened was that gold started going high, you know, up again, which really is a reflection of loss of purchasing power of the currencies rather than gold rising. And it probably got a bit overdone when it ran up to about 1840, I think, in around about August or September um, 2011. Um, that uh, bull market was killed by intervention in the markets. Um, and uh, so it wasn't really until about 2016 that things started moving up again. Um, the situation now, um, after the COVID incident, when uh, governments just threw money at the whole economy, they shut down the economies and basically paid everyone not to work, not to attend anything, not to go to the office. Um, the effect of that, of course, was highly, highly destabilizing for the currencies. It must be. Uh, and um, then on top of that, we had um, uh, the action against uh, Russia in the Ukraine. Uh, which admittedly was started by Russia, but, you know, I mean, basically we just threw caution to the winds and decided, to, you know, we really got to get the Russians. Uh, and consequently, the Russians sat on the, on uh, you know, the supply of, uh, of energy and drove up prices, came off a little bit, but they're doing it again. So we now have a bookended situation. The first decade, of fiat currencies, pure fiat currencies, was very, very volatile in currencies, um, very destabilizing. Um, and somehow we managed to get through that. We had that long period, um, uh, really from about 1980 to uh, just a few years ago, uh, where the whole thing appeared to be relatively calm and stable. Okay, there are a few banking crises and, you know, so what? <laughs> that, that, that happens. But recently we have evidence that... Um, these fiat currencies are becoming destabilized again. And um, this uh, brings in huge, great problems because uh, over the period of declining interest rates, over a long period of declining interest rates, the amount of unproductive debt in everyone's economy has increased and increased. And uh, not only that, but governments have thrown caution to the winds on their spending. And uh, as a result, um, Virtually all governments now have debt to GDP ratios, which are, you know, sky high. I mean, you know, at levels which uh, economists previously would said, well, you know, a fiat currency cannot survive this debt to GDP relationship. Um, you know, I think, I think, um, was it Kotlikoff? No, it wasn't Kotlikoff. I can't remember. There's another one. One of those very famous uh, American uh, economists who said Maybe that... You've got it. Absolutely. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one. It was saying that uh, anything over 90 percent uh, debt to GDP is sort of getting into a debt spiral. And I mean, guess what? That's what we're seeing now. I mean, just look at the uh, debt situation in the United States. I mean, you're well over 100 percent debt to GDP on, on government debt. And uh, um, we find that with rising interest rates, suddenly the interest rate bill in this fiscal year that's just ended at the end of September um, is sort of, I don't know, it'll probably turn out to be about 900 uh, billion or something like that. So what's the, you know, what's the interest bill going to be for the current, this new fiscal year? Well, I guess it's going to be about one and a half trillion. And when you think that uh, not so long ago, uh, you know, a trillion on the deficit was, oh, shock, horror. You know, it's just the interest now is well in excess of that. So, you know, this is an example of how a debt trap works. When you get into a situation when you can't really cut government spending and your interest bill is rising and rising and rising and you're going to have funding difficulties down the line, you know, raising extra debt and all the rest of it, because the numbers no longer add up. 
um, that is called a debt trap. And that's really what we're going into now. So it's a sort of bookended situation. You had the rough period, you had the time of calm, and now we're coming to the end of the fiat currency era. And it really is the end. What we will presumably discuss is what replaces it. But this is that that is how I see it at the moment. And I think uh, quite a number of other commentators have sort of gone down this route. Um, uh, I mean, um, Zoltan Poza, for example, in a famous Credit Suisse um, analyst who's now set out on his own, um, I think he was the first person to come up and say, this is Bretton Woods 3. And that sort of meme has actually, you know, it's been cottoned onto by quite a lot of people that, you know, the idea of Bretton Woods, you know, the end of Bretton Woods, that was Bretton Woods 1. Bretton Woods 2 was that long period I've just described. And Bretton Woods 3 is you know, the move away from fiat into something which he said um, would be more, you know, currencies um, uh, uh, associated with commodities, that sort of, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but if you're going to so associate a currency with a commodity, then really what you're talking about is um, linking it into one commodity, which represents all the others. And that, of course, is real legal money, which is physical gold. And um, we just don't have it. <laughs> So, so this is going to be an interesting time for us. I'm, I'm afraid. I would rather it wasn't this interesting, but it is interesting. Hello, Chris Martinson. I'm the CEO of Peak Prosperity and also Peak Financial Investing. And after watching that, you're probably wondering, well, what do I do with my money? Look, you both deserve and need somebody who can talk to you about what's really going on in this world, understand the situation as it is, not be steering you towards certain things that don't make sense for you or just keep you in a game that's already ended. Look, if you want to talk to somebody about the petrodollar declining or what is happening with gold or which sectors are actually the best ones to be in, given what the Federal Reserve is up to or the federal government, you deserve to talk to somebody who can answer those and has a few gray hairs and has been there through some of the economic cycles because, hey, we're in another economic cycle, so it's good to have that experience. Fortunately, at Peak Financial Investing, what we do is we go out and we scour and we look for the very best firms out there who satisfy one thing above all else. They've got great experience coupled to great customer service. So if you want to come by peakfinancialinvesting.com, there's a very simple form you can fill out. Just a few fields. You hit send. What happens is an email gets triggered out. It goes to uh, an endorsed firm of ours. You will get an email back. You can then set up a phone call for a 30 to 45 minute free, no obligation, no pressure call to find out if this firm is a good fit for you and to find out if you're a good fit for the firm. It has to go both ways. And if all that matches up, this will be one of the best things that could happen to you this year. So please come by peakfinancialinvesting.com. Very simple process. We would love to help you if we can. Thanks very much.